It's so good to be back with y'all. Um, we've been we've been uh, traveling quite a bit lately. Uh, my wife Kathy is right here in the front row, and and uh, it's good to have her with me again. <laughs> She wasn't here before, so you get to meet her for the first time. But uh, last time I was here, she wasn't with me. Um, it's been, I think it was four years ago, three or four years ago that I was here before. So it's, it's always good to be back in the Berg. And, you know, um, on Thursday, I was in Philadelphia and then in Delaware. And so, you know, that's foreign territory. So it's, it's just good to be back. Uh, yesterday, I spoke at a men's conference out in Elizabeth and had a great, great time there. And when Pastor Tim heard I was going to be in the area, he said, hey, would you come and share? And I said, I'd love to. It's always good to be back in the Berg. You know what I mean? There's nothing like being in Pittsburgh. As Kathy and I were driving through the city this morning, uh, our family actually lives in the South Hills of Pittsburgh. And as we, we stayed with them over the weekend, we now live in Mechanicsburg out near Harrisburg where the offices are. But as we were driving in, it's, it's just a beautiful city. And uh, to drive through the tunnels and hit that city hits you head on, it's always, and we were praying for the city and praying for God to do something special here today. Amen? Amen. It's great. Amen. That's right. You know, people get so excited at the football game, and uh, then we come to church, and we just sit. <clears throat> now, I get excited with the Steelers. I, 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 I kind of get excited. I just, who's going to be their next quarterback? Uh, that's, you know, that's the big question out there today. I'm a Kenny Pickett fan, I must admit, but uh, we'll see what happens. But, you know, people get excited at football games. It's time for us to get excited what God is doing. Amen? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you and praise you. This is the day that you have made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Father, we thank you for the privilege of being here, and I thank you for the privilege of sharing your word this morning. May the words of my mouth and meditation of my heart be pleasing to you. You are my rock and my redeemer. Give us ears to hear what you would say to us today, Father, and change, challenge us and change us by your presence. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. Amen. I've been reading lately in my devotions, and sometimes, you know, I do different kind of devotions, and this year I'm going through the Bible. Hey, babe, can you give me my water, please? I forgot to bring my water up here. Thank you. I've been reading through my devotions, and, uh, and as I'm reading, I came across a passage of Scripture that just messed me up. Did you ever do that? Did you ever read the Bible when you read something, and, and, and you know, it, what? So I, I was reading this, and it's in Genesis chapter 8, verse 1. I think, do, do we have it there? Genesis chapter 8, verse 1. It'll be coming up here in just a minute. But in Genesis 8, 1, it says, But God remembered Noah and all the wild animals and the livestock that were with him on the ark. And he sent a wind over the earth, and the waters receded. God remembered Noah. Now that messed me up. I don't know about you, but it messed me up. Uh... Uh, did God forget about Noah? Did he just forget about him? You know, l let me put this into context. God put Noah and his family on the ark and the animals, the groups of animals, okay? So the only people that were alive on the earth was Noah, his family, and the animals. What did God have to think about? He opened up the faucets of heaven Okay, and he unplugged the, the, the fountains underneath, and the earth was flooded. And so and he put them on this boat, and they were the only ones that were alive during this time, the only people alive. And, you know, and I'm thinking about that. I'm thinking, that doesn't make sense to me. You know, when we say, uh, I, you know, I, I remembered something, why do we say it? Because we forgot it in the first place, Right? And I'm notorious for forgetting things. I forget my keys. I forget different things. I love, I have a new app on my phone that I could start my car with my phone. I love that. But I, sometimes I forget my keys and my phone, then I'm in trouble. You know what I mean? But uh, somebody got it back there. You understand what I'm saying? <coughs> But the word remembered sometimes gets messed up in, 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 in the language. When you read the Bible, you know, the words that we read in English don't always, the words, the original Hebrew doesn't always translate exactly into the way we read it in the scriptures. And, and uh, actually, in Genesis chapter 8, 1, doesn't mean to recall something that's been forgotten, because let's, let's face it, God can't forget anything because he knows the beginning from the end. He's all-knowing, Right? So what it means, really, is to pay attention, but here it is, to fulfill a promise on behalf of someone or somebody. To fulfill a promise. 
If, for example, uh, in Hebrews 10, 17, it says, and their sins and their iniquities I will remember no more, means that God doesn't hold our sin against us when we ask for forgiveness. Aren't you glad for that? You know, when we mess up and we say, Father, forgive me, and then we go back to him and we say, hey, God, do you remember this sin? He said, no, I don't remember that because I've forgiven you for it. Aren't you glad you're forgiven? Amen. Where would we be about that? I'll tell you what. But God deals with us as if our sins have n never been committed. The Lord remember them, remembers them no more. I, 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 uh, there, there, there's a, a character in history that I absolutely love, Corey Ten Boom. I heard a story, Corey Ten Boom, the hiding place when she was in a Nazi concentration camp. She said this one time, God takes our sins, past, present, and future, dumps them in the sea, and puts up a sign that says no fishing. All right? No fishing. He remembers them no more. To remember implies, now, now I want you to get this, to remember implies a previous commitment made by God and announces the fulfillment of that commitment. <clears throat> when, you, <clears throat> when you see in the scriptures that God remembered that means God's fulfilling his promise that he made. God has made us promises. And in the scriptures, when you see that, God remembered that term, it means God is going to fulfill his promise. It's time for God to fulfill his promise. Noah and his family and animals have been together for over a year <laughs> in a boat, not able to go anywhere with a bunch of animals. Put that in your mind for a minute. Let's, let's forget about the animals. You have your family in a boat together that can't go anywhere. Some of you are getting this. Okay? And, and, and you know, sometimes, you, have you ever had too, many, too much togetherness? You know what I mean? And, and, okay, we have one honest person in the house in the back row. Okay, good. Sometimes when you get with your family, there's too much togetherness. And what happened is, Noah was in this boat, not just with his family, but with a bunch of animals. I'll you let you use your imagination for a minute to take you places. Did they, get, did, did they get impatient with one another? Did they get impatient with the animals? Okay, it's your turn to clean up the animals. No, it's not. It's your turn. No, I did it yesterday. It's your turn. You can just imagine what was going on there. Okay, and, what's, well, this is, and I want you to catch this. There's no record in the scriptures that God ever spoke to them after he shut them in the ark. For 150 days, God didn't speak to them. God didn't speak to, 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 to Noah for 100, almost said Moses. God didn't spoke to Noah for 150 days. There was silence. Can you imagine that? Have you ever been there? God does something supernatural in your life and then you feel like the the heavens are brass. You can't get through. Your, your prayers can't get through. You know, and, th and that's what happened during that time. When Noah was on the ark, we have no record of God speaking to them for 150 days. You know, we're saved. We're filled with the Holy Spirit. We're healed. We're delivered. Then nothing. You pray and pray and pray, but nothing happens. Wait a minute, God. You promised that you'd be with me. You promised you'd never leave me. Where are you now? I've been praying and praying and praying, and I don't have an answer. I've never heard from you. Where are you now? God supernaturally saved and delivered Noah's family. He kept them on a huge boat for 377 days, and half of that time was silent. But God remembered and fulfilled his promise that he made to Noah in Genesis 6.18. He said, I will establish my covenant with you, you will enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. He fulfilled that promise. He fulfilled the promise that he gave. And God gave Noah clear instructions. If you read through Genesis, you know, a lot of people say, why are there so much details in the scriptures? And I love the details in the scriptures because that proves that it was fulfilled. The more detailed it is, the more precious it is to me. Because, I, because God cares about the little things in your life, the details in your life. He cares about them. He gave clear instruction of Noah how to build the ark, what to build it from, how big to build it. And it says in Genesis 6.22, Noah did everything just as God commanded him. 
You see, God made a covenant with Noah. A covenant is an agreement between two people. But they both have to keep up their end. Noah kept up his end when he did everything God asked him to do. And let me tell you something. When the, when, when the flood came from the earth, most historians believe it had never rained before. So when God said he was going to destroy the earth by rain, they say, what? What are you talking about? And if you read the scriptures, it not only rained, it, the water also came up from the depths. That never happened before. So Noah had to believe something that never happened before. A lot of us, you know, uh, you know, we've been around long enough. We have the word of God. We have testimonies. We have things that, of people that have been healed, people that have been delivered, people that have been saved from a, a extreme circumstances and situations. We have a testimony of that happening in the past. But Noah never had that. He trusted God not knowing anything about it. He just trusted in his word. Faith. He just trusted in his word. God fulfilled his end of the covenant and Noah fulfilled his end of the covenant, for sure. Then God sent Noah a rainbow in Genesis 9, 16. He said this, Whenever the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and all the living creatures that came to the earth, every kind on the earth. Whenever the rainbow appeared in the clouds, I will remember. You see, when he said that, God remembered, it's time to fulfill my promise. God was fulfilling a promise once again. Fulfilling a promise. To, you know, the rainbow's been hijacked by the world. But it was God's in the first place. You know, the devil does that all the time. He hijacks things that God created. Marriage, God created it. Man and women, God created it. And, and it's been hijacked by the world, by the devil. It's time for us to take it back, amen? God hasn't forgotten about us. It's time to take it back. You know, and the rainbow was a sign of the promise. So next time you look up in the sky and you see a rainbow, say, thank you, Father, for your promises. You know, and go, go through the promises of God. Thank you, Father, for your promises, that you'll never leave me or forsake me, that you hold me in the palm. Just start thanking them. That's what it's there for. <clears throat> it's not there to say, oh, wow, isn't that pretty. It's there to remind us of the promises of God. And now let's look at uh, another example in Genesis chapter 21, verse 1. The Lord graciously remembered and visited Sarah as he said, and the Lord did for her as he promised. Okay? Here we have it again. God remembered Sarah. God fulfilled a promise he made to Sarah back in Genesis chapter 17 that he would bless her and give her a son, even though she was past the childbearing age. Okay, so this promise was given to her. Again, uh, a woman her age had never had a child before. But now God was giving her a child at her old age. A long time had passed. But God said, now it's time to fulfill my promise. And he gave her a son. In Genesis 41, God remembered Joseph when he was imprisoned. I love the story of Joseph, and you know, you know what happened to him, how he was sold into slavery. Uh, his brothers wanted to kill him in the first place, because why? Because he had a dream, a vision from God, and it was a promise that his brothers and even his dad would bow down before him. Two different dreams that this would happen. So his brothers, you know, and there comes a dreamer again, you know, dad's favorite, you know, uh, yeah. Have you ever been a favorite child? The other kids kind of think, you know, no, yeah, you're the favorite. You know, I was the favorite. Uh, I was the favorite child. I'm going to, Bill, you could attest to it. I was the favorite. Uh, you know, that's, that's just the way it was. And, and there's, you know, there's benefits of being a favorite, but also for your siblings, it, you know, it's a little different. And um, so, so Joseph was the favorite, and so they sold him. Instead of killing him, they sold him into slavery. Uh, he was picked up and went to Potiphar. Everywhere he went, he received favor. He went into Potiphar's house. He received favor. He was in prison. He received favor. When he was in prison, there was a cupbearer and a baker that were in there. He interpreted their dreams, and he said to them, he said to the one, he said to the cupbearer, remember me when you get out. 
what happened? He forgot about him. And then the king had a dream. Pharaoh had a dream. And, and then all once, oh, yeah, the cupbearer remembered. There was this guy I was in prison with. For years, Joseph was imprisoned, either in a pit, in slavery, or in an actual prison. But God remembered him. And, and God fulfilled the promise he made to Joseph when he became second in command under Pharaoh. He was in charge of all the land, second in command at the world at that time. And when the famine came to the world, his brothers came and bowed down before him. God fulfilled the promise that he made. And, and I, love what, I love what it says in, in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. You see, the father had died. So the brothers thought, uh-oh, now Joseph's going to come after me. But what did he say? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. God has a plan for your life. You don't always see it. You don't always realize it. And maybe God has made some promises to you that haven't been fulfilled yet. But let me tell you, there's coming a time when God is going to fulfill his promise to you. We have to keep up our end of the deal. We have to stay faithful. One of my favorite verses, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. He'll make your path straight. In other words, the promise will come true that he's given you. That the promise has come true. And we read through the book of Judges. You know, the book of Judges, you ever want to be entertained? You know, anybody that says the Bible is boring, read the book of Judges. I mean, it's amazing. I love the book of Judges. And in the book of Judges, you know, the, the, God sent them a redeemer. God sent someone into the land, uh, a judge, to, to come and to help them out. And what happened is things were going great for a while, and then they rebelled, then they repented, and God sent another. Then they rebelled, then God, they repented, and God, it's a cycle. But God never let them go because they're his people. He said, I will remember my people, and I will keep them. And he rescued them. He remembered them because of the covenant that he had. Sometimes in our failures, we think our actions limit what God can do. We can allow our failures to affect our prayer lives. So often, we, we feel like we have failed, so we quit praying. No, man, that's when we need to pray more. And God knows. God knows where you're at, and God knows your situations in your life. And he wants to fulfill his dream in your life, if you'll just let him. He wants to fulfill his promises in your life. But what happens is, so often we, something happens in our life, and, and we let those failures, uh, we let affect our prayer life, or our devotional life, or coming to church. We let those things happen. And God says, no, 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 hey, come on, man. I'm with you. I am with you. Prime example of this in the scriptures is Samson. Samson knew he disappointed his parents by the choices he made. He also knew that the choices and behavior broke the heart of God. God used him in a mighty way, but yet sin got a hold of him. And then in Judges 16, 28, Samson called unto the Lord and said, O oh Lord God, remember me. I pray, strengthen me, I pray. Only this once, O God, that I may avenge the Philistines from my two eyes. He says, God, remember me this one last time. You see, God called him to judge the sin of the land. And sometimes that judging required taking people out. And so this one more time, he said, God, remember me. He had sinned. He was punished for his sin. He lost the strength that was in his life the anointing in his life. <clears throat> One of the saddest scriptures in the Bible is all the other times when Samson was faced with an encounter, he would shook himself, shake himself, and the power of God would come upon him. But this one time, he shook himself, and he never realized the power of God left him. That's a sad place to be, folks. When we get to a place where we don't understand that the power of God has left our lives. So what do you do? God remember me. And God will fulfill that. God will come back. God remembered him, and he killed more than he ever killed before. 
while we remember our faults, our faults and failures of ourselves and others, God does, and God removes them. And I talked about her. And he removes them as far as the east is from the west. That's an interesting statement. You know, God gives first, second, third, fourth chances. Aren't you glad? You know, you know if, if, if it would have said there that he forgives as far as the north is from the south, it would be limited. Follow me. You travel north so far, you're going to start going south. Right? But when you go east-west, you're always going east. Do you follow me? Okay? This geography, this is, this is, you're always going east. So what God's saying is, I'm going to forgive you, and I'm going to keep on forgiving you. I'm going to keep on forgiving you. I'm going to keep on being there for you because I love you. God remembered his people in the book of Esther. <coughs> I love the book of Esther. It's a great, great story of God's redemptive power. These people were under a, uh, 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 under a king, and, and, and Mordecai came in, and, and just, you know, just, just uh, some things happened, and Haman, the Agite, is a sworn enemy of Israel. And he tricked the king into a, a proclamation that would kill all the Jews. But Esther was placed there, and I love it, for such a time as this. God prepared her for the right time. God remembered Esther, remembered the people, and he said, now's the time. She went in and pleaded for the king, and everything was turned around. You see, if Haman would have succeeded, the Jews would have been killed. Do you follow me? And therefore, stopping the line to the Messiah. God says, no, 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 no. I'm remembering my promise, my everlasting covenant that I made to my people. I'm going to take care of this. God remembered. God didn't forget about Job. Job lost his family, his farm, his possessions, even his health. But in the end, it says in Job 42.12, the Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life more than the first. So no matter what you're going through, There'll come a time and say, God, remember me, and he will. And he'll fulfill his promises, because that's what he does. God even remembered Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were thrown in the fiery furnace for not bowing down to a pagan king. <coughs> in fact, God did more than remember them. He joined them in the fire. I love that. You know, so often we say, God, take me out of the fire. Take me out of this circumstance. Take me out of this situation. And God says, you know what? I'm going to join you there. I'm going to join you there. It says in Daniel 4.10, he joined them in the fire. Sometimes God may deliver you from tough times, but other times he may join you. What's it say in the psalm? Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because you are with me. He walks through those he says, Jeff, I'm not going to forget about you. I'm going to walk with you. Come on, I got you by the hand. Come on, man. Walk with me. And you know what happens when we walk through fire and difficult times? It strengthens us. It makes our faith stronger so we can withstand. And I love, I love, what, I love what the king said here. Look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed. And the fourth looks like the son of the gods. Even a king saw it. The king saw it. What a cool thing. And we know he was with Daniel. <clears throat> he didn't forget about Daniel either. Daniel would not bow down to anything or anyone except God. The king, although he loved Daniel, was tricked. And Daniel would not bow down. And so what happened, he was thrown into the den of hungry lions. And the king went home and went to bed. And Daniel was thrown into this den of hungry lions. And what happened? The lions got indigestion. They weren't hungry that day for some strange reason. God supernaturally filled their bellies and took away their desire. And so the next morning, the next morning, the king rushed 
rush because he was hoping. And I imagine he may have been praying. Because Daniel was a, a godly man in a secular place. And he made a difference. Folks, you may be in a difficult situation where you work or where you live. But you can make a difference by the testimony of the way you live your life. God remembered Daniel in the lion's den. And an amazing thing happened. The king came to visit Daniel in the morning, and he said, Hey, Daniel! The king, the king cried out. And Daniel said, Hey, King Darius, how you doing? It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. That's a martial translation, by the way. And the king said, This is amazing. We need to worship this king. God remembered him. God remembered him. I can give you example after example in the scriptures of how God came to rescue his people just in time. Let me tell you something. He's not forgotten about you. God remembers you right where you are in the situations that you're in. No matter how dark, no matter how dismal, no matter how, mu how much time you feel like God hasn't been there. You know, we often say, where's God? God doesn't move. We do. We distance ourselves from him. He doesn't distance himself from us. The scriptures tell us you draw close to God. He will draw close to you. That is a promise. A promise from God. And God will remember his promises to fulfill them in his life. In, in, in his life. God created you with a plan. I love Isaiah 49, 16. 49, 16. Can you read this with me? Let's read it. See? I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. Think about that for a minute. Look at your hand. Everybody, look at your hands. Come on, come on. Listen to me now. Come on. If you don't listen, I'm going to come and get you. Come on, come on. Look at your hands. God has you engraved on his hands. Think about that for a minute. Your name is engraved on the hand of God. So there's nothing you can do to get God to forget about you. Even in sin, God remembers you like he did Samson. Again, we're the ones that distance ourselves. Let's go to the New Testament for a minute. Luke 23. Three men are hanging on a cross. A conversation emerges between the three. Two are criminals. One is innocent. Luke 23, 39 through 43 says this. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at Jesus. Aren't you the king of the Jews? Save yourself. The other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly for we are getting what our deeds deserve, but this man has done nothing wrong. And then here we go. Then he said this. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. I love that. The simple statement, remember me. God had been remembering his promises to his people for years and years and years and years and years. Now Jesus is hanging on the cross, and this one thief says, remember me. And Jesus says, you got it. Today, I'll remember you. The simple statement gained him eternity. Remember me. It wasn't by what he did, it's by who he believed in. He didn't have time to do all the good works. He didn't have time to take a class on baptism or salvation or those things. He said, Jesus, remember me. And Jesus says, you're in heaven with me today. Isn't that amazing? Amazing to think about. It's not what we have done, but it's what Jesus did on the cross. We need to remember what Jesus had done for us. Often we forget we're, 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 we're going into the time of the resurrection of Jesus, of the Holy Week, of the, of the, the betrayal, uh, the death, the burial. And the resurrection of Jesus. We, we're going into that time of year. And you know what? Let me, let me tell you this. 
more people are apt to go to church at two times of the year than any other time. Christmas and... That's it. Those two days. So you know what? You invite somebody to church on Sunday, chances are... The, you know, they may say no, but they may say yes. And they can hear the gospel message. And they'll be sitting there in a chair, maybe right there. And Jesus will remember the promise he made to them. And they'll remember promises. And they'll come forward and give their life to Jesus. But they're waiting for us to do something. The number one way people come to church is still personal invitation. You can go to big crusades. You can do all, and all those things. Billy Graham organization says it. They're all good. But the bottom line is it's still us inviting. We need to remember what Jesus has done for us. In Psalm 136, verse 2, it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of his benefits. Forget none of his benefits. How often we forget his benefits. One of my favorite benefits that Jesus has said to me, I will never leave you and I'll never forsake you. Whoa. Yes, he takes care of us. There's many other benefits. But, you know, it says in that passage here in Psalm 103 that he heals all our diseases. He takes care of us. Yes, but he'll never leave you or forsake you. He will remember you right where you are. He'll remember you right where you are. And there's another promise. Uh, the, there was a promise made in Joel in the Old Testament that I will pour out my spirit on all people. Young men. Dream dreams. Oh man, what the prophesy? I'll pour out my spirit on all people. That was given in the in the book of Joel, and we saw that fulfilled in the book of Acts. Years later, God remembered His promise, and God's still fulfilling that promise today to come and fill you with power and might. Maybe one of the reasons you are afraid to witness to someone you've never been experienced a power that's available through the Holy Spirit. God remembered his promise, and he's continuing to fill up, fill out that promise, fulfill that promise daily with us. Your faith in Jesus is not about you. Do you understand me? Your salvation is not just about you. Yes, it's so you'll go to heaven someday. But you are God's instrument on this earth to bring people to Jesus. You're it. You're plan A. You're it. And he says, in fact, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit to help you. Perhaps the reason you can't witness to somebody is you've never been baptized with power of the Holy Spirit in your life. But so often we get so consumed that our Christianity is all about us. It's all about us. Something happened just a few days ago that I found quite amusing. Pastor Jack Hibbs, the pastor of Calvary Chapel in California, prayed in the House of Representatives. He prayed in the name of Jesus. And one of the articles that was printed says this. It said, amidst a backdrop of political division, Pastor Jack Hibbs' recent appearance as a guest chaplain at the U.S. House of Representatives endorsed by House Speaker Mike Johnson, by the way, who is a believer and you need to pray for him, has ignited a contentious debate over the intersection of religion and politics. Go to the next slide, please. Hibbs, known for his fervent spiritual leadership, delivered a prayer laden with calls for national repentance and the fear of the Lord, stirring both support and backlash within the political community. Thank God someone had the power in their life to do that. Thank God. We need a revival in this nation, and it's not coming from a political party. I don't care if you're Democrat or Republican. You need Jesus. That's where it's coming from. And I saw an interview with him, and I love this. I saw an interview with him, and they said, he's been interviewed numerous times, and I loved his response. They said, what do you think about the backlash you received from the politicians? And this is what he said. I wasn't praying to them. I was praying to God. I love it.
Next time someone complains about the worship here, say, it's okay, I wasn't worshiping you, I was worshiping God. <laughs> Mike does a great job. You can use that, Mike. Next time somebody complains, you say, it's not for you, it's for God. Don't tell Pastor Tim I said that, please. <laughs> Let's remember who we're praying to and who we're worshiping. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 24, it says, Do this in remembrance of me. We're talking about communion. When Jesus said, remember me. We've looked through the scriptures and we've seen how other people said to God, remember me. God remembered. The thief said, Jesus, remember me. Now Jesus is saying, remember me. Remember the promises I have for you. When you're worship, remember him. When you're doing communion, remember him. During the message, remember him. As you read the Bible, remember him. As you go to work, remember him. As you talk to people, remember him. Remember what he's done for you. He said, I will never leave you. And then throughout the scriptures, there's another thing he said. I will never forget about you. God loves you more than you can imagine or think. Mike, if you can come up here. He loves you more than you can imagine or think. And he wants to fulfill his promises in your life. So then, in the annals of history, it'll say, God remembered Bill. God remembered Jane. God remembered Shirley. God remembered your name. In other words, he fulfilled his promise to you. It may have taken a lifetime, but he'll never leave you, he'll never forsake you. If you could